All right, test, test. Everyone hear me all right? How's everyone doing this morning? Doing good? All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I am James Snell. Uh, I am head of research at Nearform. Um, also a Node Core contributor. Um, you know, I've worked on quite a bit of, of, of things within Node. Um, right now, the thing I'm working on is the quick implementation um, that Trevikum was talking about yesterday. Um, but at Nearform, one of the things that we do is, you know, we have a lot of customers that come to us and ask us, you know, say, hey, our stuff is slow. Come help us figure out why our, why our, why our code is slow. And over the past couple of years, we've, we've come to ask one very specific question when a customer comes to us and says, hey, our stuff is slow. The first question is, are you using promises? Right? And if they'd say yes, our, our response right away is, you're using them wrong. Well, you know, you haven't even looked at our code yet. We don't have to. You're using them wrong. Right? Because so what we have found in the overwhelming majority of cases, when anybody is using promises, they are, at some way, at some level, using them incorrectly. So that is the inspiration of this talk, is basically all the ways that we have seen customers using promises incorrectly, and kind of breaking down why, uh, why it's incorrect, kind of, you know, how to, how to avoid those issues. Now, one example, um, they got called out by a customer, they were having some really poor response times on their API. Uh, I decided to do a 30 second benchmark on one path of their code, right? So we're basically just sending the same request over and over and over again uh, against their server, executing a single branch, a single path. Within that 30 second benchmark, they were allocating 30,000 promises, okay? Um, I'll explain why in just a little bit, um, but there are a few other examples like that that I will share with you, all right? So promises are powerful, yes, they're, they're, they're in a language. You really have to understand how, uh, how they function and what their, what their purpose is, right? When to use them and especially when not to use them, right? Everything that I'm gonna show you is based on what we have seen actual customers do in, in production code. All right, so you know some of the examples. You know, I've I've simplified the examples. I'm not going to say what you know who's you know what customers and what companies are doing what. Right, so I've completely anonymized it. Some of the examples may look a bit contrived, but they are based on stuff we've actually seen in the uh, 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 out in the real world. But first, I want to do a puzzle. I've done this a few times. This code prints a message. It's a secret message. Right, without running the code, try to figure out what the message is. Um, you can, you know, without trying to, to copy down here, you can scan the, uh, the QR code. Um, I'll also post this on, 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 on my Twitter feed after this. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the task is try to figure out what the message is without running it, all right? What this code is doing is using all the various ways you can schedule asynchronous activity in Node. So we have next ticks, we have immediates, um, we have some promises in there, Q micro task, right? Uh, so this will print a message out. Uh, if you figure it out, again, without running the code, let me know. All right? So I'll give you a moment to, folks, scan the QR code there. Okay? All right. So the reason I like to start with this particular example is that because it, it, it emphasizes the fact that you really need to understand when code is being executed within, within Node or within JavaScript in general. All right? So... We all know Node is a JavaScript platform, right? Is JavaScript running all of the time in Node? No. Right? No. All right, so let me show you a quick example of this. So if I do a set interval, right, I'm going to set it for um, uh, you know, about a second. Actually, let me, let me change this a little bit. We're going to set it to run every uh, 500 milliseconds, and we're going to have this thing do a for loop and then do a uh, 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 console log. Very, very simple application. So I'm going to run this. I'm going to turn on trace events. And we're going to turn V8 and async hooks. So this is basically going to give us some insight into what is happening under the covers on this. And they're going to run this. Okay. So it's just going to iterate through five times. That's going to end up creating this file, this node trace dot one file. Let's pop back over. Chrome tracing is it's, it's a utility built into uh, a Chrome browser. It allows you to view trace event log that is generated by Node or, or, or by the browser. So let's load this thing up. This file that we just created, this node underscore trace, 
Might be a little bit hard to read there from the back, but these pink boxes right here are the, are the times when Node and V8 are actually executing JavaScript. The blank spaces between are times when no JavaScript is being run. That is times when the node event loop is doing other things. In this case, it's waiting for that, event, uh, for that timer to fire, right? So within that time, the event loop is actually spinning, right? But while the pink boxes are executing, the event loop is not spinning. The event loop is completely blocked, OK? Now, when we say schedule asynchronous activity, what we're talking about is in one of the pink boxes, triggering some action that is not going to complete until another pink box starts, OK, uh, you know, on this. So basically, like if we want to do a file read, right? File reads in Node happen in a, in, a, in a thread pool. So we trigger the file read. It's going to go off and read the file in a separate thread. When that file when the data is available, after the event loop turns, right, it'll see, OK, that data is available now. Then it'll start executing JavaScript again. All right? With a promise. You never, ever want to create a promise that resolves within the same uh, execution block that it was created, if you can avoid it. All right? When I say you can avoid it, if you're using like promise.resolve, right, that is uh, explicitly a synchronous promise, right? With promises that you, you know, don't ever use them where they resolve in the same block. You want to use it to, you know, when, it, when you create it, you're scheduling some asynchronous activity. It's happening off the main event loop. And then it's going to come back and execute later on, right? That's key. That, that, that's, that's, that's number one. And I'll get into a little bit about why that is a little bit later. <coughs> OK. So people do weird things with async functions and promises. Um, they pass them to functions that don't expect them. Uh, so creating an immediate timer with an async function, or setting a recurring timer with an async function. What happens in this case if this throws? Right? What happens to that error? Huh? You say, yeah, you get a support email. That's, what, that's basically what you, what you do. Um, what ends up happening in this case, uh, is, is this error catchable in any way? No. You, I mean, you can do a try catch inside this thing, but then you know, your, your error happening is, is limited in, inside that. You can't bubble it out anywhere, right? So with this case, what you end up with is an unhandled rejection. You can't actually catch any errors thrown within that async function um, outside of that, of that function, right? We see this in all kinds of places. So if we take a look at event emitter, people love passing async functions to, you know, uh, to handle events. Uh, now, just recently within Node Core, I'll, I'll show an example of this later, we just had a, uh, a new feature landed called capture rejections that makes event emitter aware of promises. But most cases, if you're talking about event emitter, if you're talking about uh, callback functions, these things are not expecting promises. They're, they're not expecting async functions. And they do not know how to handle them correctly. And what you're going to end up with are cases where you are either, you know, you know it, it, at the best case, you have an unhandled rejection. At the worst case, you have memory leaks, resource leaks. In this case, uh, we would be leaking a file descriptor, right? That would never end up getting closed if there's an error somewhere in here. Uh, you end up with uh, uh, asynchronous context that's not propagated properly down through all of your callbacks or all your promises, right? You can end up with orphaned promise chains that have, you have no way of handling, right? And all kinds of other kind of kind of nastiness. Um, you know, and we actually get into debates with this. You know, you know, you know, Matteo uh, Kalina has gotten on Twitter and said, don't mix callbacks and, uh, and promises together. And then we actually end up with debates on this, uh, on this stuff saying, no, it's no problem. We, we, we can show specific examples here of them, uh, uh, of, of memory leaks happening, right? Um, let me, I have one in here. Let me look at this. Okay, so right here. We open a file, and it's just kind of the local file. Uh, we read it, we open the file descriptor, we, you know, we have some error handling in there, right? Then let's call, you know, a function, you know, you know happen to be something that, you know, the uh, uh, reference is not resolved, right? Uh, in this case, that async function is going to throw with an unhandled rejection, and that fs close is never going to fire, 
Now, a lot of times we will have a you know promise or a process on unhandled rejection to do some logging, right? So maybe you're, you're, you'll, you'll see an unheld rejection show up or an error in your logs, but the actual file descriptor itself never actually gets closed. We see this all of the time. Now it's possible to get around this. You use you know, a try catch in this function, use a finally uh, uh, in here to close it, but most of the time developers completely forget to do that. Right? Um, this is one of the most common issues that we, we see. All right. So this is, you know, and these are things that are, that are, that are, that are, that are easily checked. The, the simple rule on this, don't pass an async function or promise to a callback that does not expect it, period. Just don't do it, all right? Now another weird one that we've been seeing lately that's just bizarre are people mixing new promise and async functions, right? The, 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 the oddest one of this that I've seen recently was await new promise that was passed an async function. And then the resolve, it was resolve await something. Right? I, I, mean, I, I still don't quite know what they were trying to accomplish. Right? Um, it was not what they expected. <laughs> All right? uh, let me ask you this. If I have a regular function like this, or a new promise, and I throw in here, right? what's going to happen? Is that going to get caught or is it going to be thrown um, immediately? It's immediately thrown. A lot of folks think anything that's, any error that's within a promise is going to get caught by the, by the catch handler. It is not, right? It is only caught if it happens in a, in a dot then or a dot catch, right? You know, in one of the, in the chain. The function that is passed to the promise itself, that will throw immediately. When is this function executed? Immediately, right? There is a common misconception, particularly among developers that are coming from Java and .NET environments, that new promise is equivalent to new thread. Right? There is, you know, it's, it's, it's a very common misconception. I, I, I had to sit down and prove it for, I think it was about 45 minutes, um, go through a, a proof for a customer that we were at with their, with their del developer team. They were absolutely convinced that new promise was, was uh, 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 running in parallel. Right? Just kind of magical new threads. There's a huge amount of misconception out there uh, uh, about how this works, right? So this error, it's going to get thrown immediately. What happens if I do this? If we pass an async function at, and we throw that error? All right, again, what we're going to end up with an unhandled rejection. All right, now do you think the catch handler is going to catch it? Let's just say, let's just console log it, right? Or console log the message, right? You think that's going to handle it? There's a, there's a common, you know, belief that, yeah, if you pass an a, 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 a promise to this thing, you're worth it in promises, it will not catch it. You get an unhandled rejection. The catch handler cannot see this in any way. But we are seeing this more and more and more. I think we've seen this in, I think, three or four customer projects just over the past couple of months. All right? And this is based on a, on a belief that, hey, async functions are great. Let's use them everywhere. No. Like, just, just no at all. All right? So we have that one. Um, very important. Just, you know, you have to be very careful about where promises are actually being used. You, they, they are a very specific tool that are used only for scheduling asynchronous activity and waiting for the results of that activity, right? But as we'll see as we go along, there's lots of other ways that people are, 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 are abusing these things, all right? So let's uh, move forward here. All right. So if we're not going to be passing an async function to a callback, if we are uh, not supposed to be mixing these things, how do we actually get by it, right? The answer is, if you're going to be using promises, go all in on promises. If you're going to be using callbacks, just do everything callbacks, right? If you're going to be mixing them, it's, it actually gets very complicated. I'll show you an example of, of kind of doing it right, and I'll show you how complicated it gets. This, in this case, we're fully, you know, we're using promises throughout the entire thing. 
So we're using the promisified version of the FS um, module, right? So we have a promisified version of open that we can await. What this, um, what this version of open gives you is a file handle object that will automatically close if you forget to do it. Now, it'll give you a warning, but it will, it will go ahead and clean up after itself if you forget to do it try to avoid that memory leak. But it'll, give, it'll, it'll be noisy when it does it. It'll say, hey, you should be explicitly closing this thing. Do that next time. All right? So this is a much safer way of doing this. Error handling is consistent throughout. Uh, and we're properly um, um, uh, propagating errors in context here. All right? So just as a general rule, do not mix callbacks and promises. Do one or the other. All right? Now, it is possible, like I said, to combine them. But it becomes much more complicated. All right? So in this particular case, I'm creating the promise. I have the resolve reject. I have two callbacks, two nested callbacks that are happening. Right? I'm having to propagate the reject through those different levels. So this is, you know, if you've heard of callback hell, this is, you know, callback and promise hell, and it just gets even nastier. Right? And the problem, the, the reason this is nasty is that promises and callbacks operate on two completely different um, uh, abstraction models. Right? You're, 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 yes, both involve scheduling async um, activity, but how they are resolved, how they, you know, in, in the execution model, are, are, are entirely different and incompatible with one another. So you have to kind of munge them together in order to get them to work. Now, utilities like util.promiseify, which will take a callback function and wrap it, it does quite a bit of work under the, under the covers to make sure this is done correctly. Right? So make use of util.promiseify. I have a few examples of that in, uh, in here. Um, this, uh, like you can do, if you want a promiseified version of uh, set timeout, then you can do, uh, let's say sleep equals util promiseify set timeout, right? And then from there, you know, like, you know, sleep actually becomes promiseified, <coughs> right? You can do whatever, right? Okay? And that actually, you know, it won't block the event loop. Um, it's just a timer that's happening um, under the covers, but it's been wrapped in a way that, that pro it, it does proper uh, propagation of errors. All right. Uh, event emitter. Uh, this was mentioned in Giuseppe's talk earlier. Uh, if you want to create an event emitter that understands uh, proper error handling with, with async functions, you can do, let's see, if you pass in the capture rejections, now this isn't in a, in a, in a node release yet, um, so it's not going to work with the version of node I'm using here because I'm using a uh, release version. Um, but uh, so this will error if I, you know, it won't work right properly if I um, if I run the example. But what this will do is, uh, if you pass an async function in, if it errors, it will uh, cause a error event to be emitted properly, right? It won't be hidden by the uh, the promise chain. Okay. So there are ways to do this correctly. It's just complicated and difficult. And uh, you know, Matteo Klein in his talk yesterday made the point that you might spend a ton of time in your code doing it correctly, but I can guarantee you there's somebody on your team <laughs> or another team that you're working with that will just do it wrong, <laughs> right? So it, it, it's very difficult to do this consistently. And we have seen this time and time and time again, uh, where especially with people not handling errors correctly, that it just falls down, okay? So, all right, so let's move on. Uh, let's see, here's the event emitter. Um, all right, so in order to do it correctly without um, uh, Mateo's fix, by the way, if you're on a version of Node that's not, that doesn't have the capture rejections yet, you can do it, but what you have to do is within a try catch in your async function, um, you catch, catch the error, uh, and then you have to make sure you emit that in a process next tick. All right? The reason we have to do that in a process next tick is because e emit is a synchronous function. When it is operating, when you call it in this context from within an async function, its error handling is bound to that promise, right? So if you throw, it's just going to be same, part of the same uh, 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 caught throw, right? And you'll end up with a, uh, uh, an unhandled rejection. So next tick allows you to escape that, right? It allows you to escape the promise. 
Right? So if you want to, you know, if you're within that and you act, absolutely want to get out of the, the promise um, error handling, you can always use uh, next tick to do so. It's ugly, it's nasty, but it works. All right? Okay. Uh, let's move on a little bit more here. Uh, okay. So the other, this, this, this one's fun. How many of you have seen long then chains in your code? All right? Uh, dot then, dot then, dot then, dot then. Uh, the worst one of these that I've seen was about 15 or 16 of these chained. Uh, it, you know, it's in a module that's you know actually pretty popularly used. We recommend now if we see it, just don't, <laughs> just don't, don't use it. Uh, and what we typically find when people have these long dot then chains is that they are being used for uh, basically make the code readable, right? Um, and they typically end up being used for uh, flow control of synchronous code. So in this particular case, we see you now this is this one's pretty contrived, but it's you know again we see this all the time. Yeah, you know, we have two upper, two lower, reverse. We're basically just isolating functionality into individual functions, and then we're going to chain them together, um, you know, uh, with, with, with dot dense. This is absolutely pointless. All of this code is resolved synchronously, right? It's all going to be executed synchronously. It's all going to be blocking the event loop in one turn, right? These promises are going to get resolved in the, the micro task queue. That's the, that's the part of all this that, that executes the dot then and dot catch handlers. Will actually be executed synchronously immediately following uh, the execution, you know, the re resolution of these promises. There is no asynchronous activity happening here at all. All you're doing is taking a block of code that executes right now in the event loop and moving it, okay, right here in the event loop, but with a whole bunch of allocate, promise allocations on top of it, right? Do not do this. Don't ever wrap Use a promise to wrap purely synchronous code. This is probably cardinal sin number one with, with promises. All right? But we see this all of the time. And every single time, it's because it makes it more readable. All right? It, may, it might make it more readable, but it's going to absolutely kill your performance. We've seen this uh, code like this. We've seen uh, it take code down maybe 60 70% performance-wise just because they're doing this kind of stuff. All right. Um, to make it even worse, people will do things like make these async functions, right? Which just causes even more al promise allocations. When you await an async function, do you know how many promises are created? Just by call, you know, if, you, if it's just a, uh, an empty async function that does nothing else, if you await that function, it creates three promises every time, no matter what else it's doing, right? Every time you await an async function, all right? So you need to be aware of what you're actually allocating here and, and, and for what purpose you're actually allocating those for, all right? So for this, you know, it, it's, it's simple. If you, if you absolutely need that get data to, re, to return a promise, right, go ahead and resolve the promise synchronously, right? And use uh, 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 promise.resolve. That's what it's there for. That's the intent. Run your code synchronously and save yourself the trouble of all those additional promise allocations. All right? There's no other, there's no other correct way of doing this. Right? Do not wrap synch purely synchronous code in a promise. In a promise chain of dot dense, the only place you should have purely synchronous code is in the final then handler. That is the only place. All right? All right. Let's keep going. Loops. Oh, these are fun. Passing an async function to a functional loop, like for each, or map, or filter. Right? The example I told you at the beginning where the people were creating 30,000 promises, this is how they were doing it. They were parsing a one meg JSON file, iterating synchronously over every field in that file, creating a promise for every field, not just a promise, a promise chain for every field, right? And the majority of those promise chains were, were resolved synchronously. So JSON parse is synchronous code, iterating through a synchronous loop, allocating thousands of promises in a, in a, in a, in a uh, 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 you know, synchronously, and then resolving them all synchronously. Now, let's see if, you know, why this is a bad thing. Let me show you. So we're going to go ahead and run, 
uh, run node again with our trace events. And then this one is, let's see. All right, so we're gonna let this run for a bit. And all this code is doing, taking, you know, setting a, a series of numbers and then inverting the values, right? We've got about a thousand of them in there. All right, so it's gonna create that trace event file again. So how many promises do you think were created during that, during that uh, operation? Let's see, well, no, let's see. Why didn't that go? All right, hold on a second. I gotta make sure my, okay, there we go. All right, so how many were created during that, during that loop? Why is this not coming up with all the information? I think I'm specifying something wrong here. Oh, yeah, no, it's no duddies and cooks. So that, uh, how many promises do we think? We said like, you know, five. Actually, there's about 8,000. Um, and we can see that here. Every single one of these lines is a promise. Um, several promises. So these are all being created in a synchronous loop, right? And we're, 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 the, the, the iteration was 1,000 iterations, right? So we have about 8,000 promises that were created over that synchronous iteration. Now, how do we know it was all synchronous? Let's go all the, way, all the way down here at the bottom, and we see this V8 execute block, right? So this is synchronous code. If we go back to the uh, trace event log, every single one of those promises was allocated synchronously within the exact same block, right? Now, in these pro particular promises, we do have a timer, right? So it is, they are scheduling asynchronous activity, but we're still allocating all those promises all at once. And there's code running in those, uh, synchronous code running in each of those, that is causing this massive event loop block. So during this time, that event loop can't do anything else, right? Uh, we have one example of a customer. Um, they were their, their system was receiving a whopping four requests per second, right? What was it doing? They were parsing very complex GraphQL queries that on the back end were talking about 10 or 15 um, back end services, right? The way uh, uh, the GraphQL implementation in Apollo works is very promise heavy. It uses these long promise chains. It goes off and parses the query, walks the query, figure, you know, figures out an execution plan for the query, right? And then kind of goes, goes through and, and uh, uh, executes the backend queries and then reassembles the data, right? Well, they were receiving a large number of timeout errors as they were, there, as they were running this thing. And that's actually why it, what was killing their, their, their throughput. What was happening is the backend services were receiving their queries, and they were returning data back, right? Now, the way that the event, uh, event loop works, when there's data that's been returned, it sits in a queue until the event loop turns, and it can say, hey, there's data available. I'm going to go ahead and fire off the callbacks associated with those, right? But timeout timers fire first. So, OK? So the event loop was being blocked long enough, it was sending the request, the backend servers were returning the data, but by the time the event loop turned over, it's like, oh, took too long. So even though the data is sitting there, uh, the, the, the system would crash. And they were only getting four requests per second through. And their solution to that was to throw a thousand more servers at it. I mean, okay, um, that works, I guess. <laughs> but. Uh, whenever you're creating promises in a synchronous loop, just don't. <laughs> or keep your iterations very, very small, right? Uh, there's an old rule, you know, don't create a, a closure, right? Limit the number of allocations you're doing in a loop. Same thing here. Every time you create a promise, right, you're allocating something on the heap, right? So we just created 8,000 objects on the heap, right, in a synchronous loop. That's just not something you want to do. You have to be aware of what's happening when you're creating these promises. All right, so... Another interesting, this, this one just qualifies under, I, I don't have any idea what they're doing or why, right? Return, await, new promise, async, resolve, <laughs> resolve first, await. This was, this was based on a real customer example we got like two weeks ago, right? Now what they're doing here is assembling an object over time, right? 
and these, uh, these awaits are actually going off and doing database queries, right? And what they want to do is if one of them dies, they don't want to continue, right? So they're not, they don't want to go off and execute all these things in parallel. They do want to do them one at a time. So they figured, let's spread it out this way. Where they came up with this return await new promise async, I have no idea. Um, there should be a lint rule against this, and it should just reach out and slap you every time you do it. <laughs> right? Um, so what's the correct way of doing this? Um, there's, there's a couple of ways. Um, let's take a look at one. Like, uh, well, that's, that's when we're doing it in parallel. All right. No. Wait. wait. What is it? Okay. So if we really wanted to wait on it, right, and do these things, you know, the way that they, they said, we just, you know, do this, right? It's much more readable. <laughs> it actually makes sense. You're not using strange, you know, syntax that, that you know, should get you slapped. Um, and, and it just works. Uh, now, in this case, you're still waiting the 600 milliseconds for, for everything to complete, right? You're still waiting for one to finish first, and if it fails, then, it, then you'll stop, right? If you wanted to do it, uh, uh, if you really did want to do it in parallel, then you could use promise all and goes off and executes these things, all right? Um, quick comment on promise all, and then I'm coming up to, you know, you know uh, uh, running out of time here. Uh, Promise all waits for you know everything to 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 finish, right? Kinda. It, it, it'll short circuit at the first uh, rejection, right? What happens to the other promises? If one of those rejects, what happens to the other promises? They, they, they continue. A lot of folks don't know that, right? Um, it's especially bad when they use when you use promise race, right? Promise race is the first one. You know, the, the, the one that finishes first is the winner. What happens if the other one is taking a very long time to finish? It still goes and still blocks your event loop, right? So using promise race actually doesn't actually buy you very much. There are use cases for it in the browser. On Node, it's just going to kill your performance, right? Um, so let me see. Yeah, yeah that's, that's essentially it. I can go back here to the slides. We have uh, some basic rules to follow. Know when your code is being executed, right? Uh, use trace events. If you use the, the dash dash trace event categories you, yeah, and, and turn on the V8 category, you will see exactly when JavaScript is running, right? You will know when, when, it's, uh, you'll know when it's not running, right? You want to make sure that you, if you are u making use of promises, that you are spanning those barriers. Your, you know, your promises should not be resolving within the same event loop, you know, the, the, the same uh, V8 execution, right? Uh, if they are, go back and figure out what's wrong or don't use a promise there, right? Um, don't use unexpected promises. Just don't, right? If a function does not, if you do not know that it is designed to take an async function, do not pass an async function. Um, you know, again, avoid mixing promises and callbacks. Use one or the other. All right. Uh, don't create promises in loops. Again, synchronous promises are just useless, and do not use long then chains. Just avoid it as much as you possibly can. All right? So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>